Welcome to the Film Florida podcast. I'm John Lux, and I'm the executive director of Film Florida. Before we get to our interview, please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the Film Florida podcast. If you're not already a member of Film Florida, please consider joining at filmflorida.org. If you like what you hear on the podcast, please consider going to our website and donating $20.23 for our 2023 fundraising campaign. We also have a Film Florida merchandise page. Visit filmflorida.creator-spring.com to purchase Film Florida t-shirts, sweatshirts, coffee mugs, and more. Charles Martin Smith is an actor, writer, and director, perhaps best known in Florida as the director of Dolphin Tale and Dolphin Tale 2. Charles talks about getting his start in the industry, how his career has evolved, his favorite roles and projects, including American Graffiti, Starman, The Untouchables, and of course, a lot of Dolphin Tale and Dolphin Tale 2 stories, and more on this episode of the Film Florida Podcast. Here's my conversation with Charles Martin Smith. Welcome to the Film Florida Podcast, Charles. Thank you. Nice to be here. So let's kind of start at the beginning. What's your origin story? Yes, well... I grew up in Los Angeles, born and raised in L.A., um, because my father was an artist and he worked in the film business as an animator. Okay. I grew up around the studios and around film, but on the animation side. And that obviously is how you got into the quote unquote industry. But, you know, when when did you decide like this was going to be a thing for you, though? It wasn't entirely how I got into it. I I, I had an interesting upbringing when when I was three, my father got a position running an animation studio in Paris. So we moved to France and I lived in Paris as a young boy, went to public school there and okay. we were going to stay, in which case I'd be a, a Frenchman at this point mm -hmm. or possibly move to London. But then he started getting more work back in Hollywood and we moved back to Hollywood and, uh, and I grew up in the Valley. But the whole city, and especially then, I guess in the 60s, there was a general sense of uh, it being a company town, an industry, a film industry town. And my interest was primarily as a teenager, it was in theater. Mm. The high schools around LA at that time all had very advanced theater programs and uh, acting programs. And I went to a wonderful school, had a wonderful acting teacher. And, and as long as I can remember, I just liked acting. I wanted to be an artist like my father, but I can't draw. <laughs> yes. whatever, whatever that synapse is in your brain that allows you to use a pencil to, I can't do it. I just don't have it. So I used whatever other talents I had. And I was always interested in acting. And I did all that in high school and then even went in, into college, did all the school plays, you know, joined the theater department at Cal State. I uh, went to UCLA briefly. And it was just what I wanted to do. And I sort of thought I would end up in the theater, which I always preferred to movies. Mm -hmm. I kind of thought that I'd maybe go into, you know, academic theater, teach acting or teach directing at a, at a university somewhere and direct the main stage plays and do all that. You know, my big dream was to go to London or, you know, study for a summer at RADA or one of those things. I was very much about that. But growing up in L.A. and out in the San Fernando Valley where I was, you know, there was always a big, I knew kids whose fathers were actors and I knew kids who were actors. Mm -hmm. One of the girls in our drama department had had a big career as an actress and continued to work for the rest of her life. So we were always around it. And I got an agent just right out of high school who wanted to send me out on some meetings. And uh, he saw me in a high school play. And I went out on a couple of meetings, auditions, and and started getting work. So I guess you're pretty good. I guess. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I like to think so. I think another thing that helped me, I was always the youngest in my class. I was 16 when I started college. But also, I looked younger, huh. you know, short and kind of, uh, I had a very youthful face. So I, I was playing 14-year-olds when I was in college. And so I had, you know, if I would go up for a role against a 14, 15, 16 year old kid, I had a lot more theater training, a lot more acting training than they did. Mm -hmm. So it, even though it was it was difficult in some ways to grow up around everybody being much older than me, 
being the kid, you know. When I started working in film, it actually didn't hurt at all. It was uh, it was helpful. Oh, that's that's an interesting story. And then one of your first acting credits is as a classic, American Graffiti. The film had some amazing actors early on in their careers. What do you remember about getting that role and that entire experience? Well, I had um, I had started working. I got my first film role like a year before graffiti and then i immediately got a couple of other parts on television i did a couple of episodes of the brady bunch and, mm -hmm. as you do and and i made a little bit of money that first year so i took a semester off of college and went to england and traveled around and stayed at stratford and you know saw a bunch of shakespeare and that's what i was doing in april of 72 and when i got back my agent said, well, it was too bad you were gone. They were casting this movie that had a lot of teenage roles in it, but I think it's so probably all cast now. Mm -hmm. Nothing left. So, but we went over anyway, just for the heck of it, knocked on the door, and poked our head into the um, Mike Fenton and Fred Roos, their casting place. They were casting graffiti. And as it turns out, it was about four or five days before the final screen tests for the film. And I just kind of came in at the very last minute and I sat in the office and read a scene with them and they sent me home with the script. And I remember sitting out in the backyard at my parents' house, reading the script, thinking, this is really good. <laughs> this is really good writing. I mean, it's about kids cruising and cars and all that stuff, but it's really well written. I, I was smart enough to understand that. And the character was 16 years old and I was 18 and, you know, already... Like I say, two years of university training under my belt. So I kind of knew what I was doing, and they invited me to come back and screen test, and I got the part. I got in very much at the last minute. Wow. Was it a fun filming? Yeah, it was tough, tough filming, because, of course, it's all nights. It right. all takes a night. So when that's tough, working, you know, when the sun goes down and then wrapping when the sun comes up, I mean, it's hard on your system, even as a kid. Yeah. Uh, and it was a fairly short schedule, so we had to work really fast, and it was really low budget. It felt like a student film almost. Mm. But, um, George Lucas was, you know, very, very quiet and very thoughtful guy, and we just idolized him. You know, we the actors in that thing. I did. We'd have done anything for George. We'd have walked over all for the guy. We had a really good feeling about it. And I had a good feeling about it. Uh, the other actors I really looked up to, um, uh, I suppose probably Rick Dreyfus and Paul Lamatt and Ron Howard, all of those guys um, for different reasons. But I watched what Richard and Paul were doing as actors and tried to kind of find that. It was a very kind of uh, sort of natural way of being there nothing theatrical about the acting it was all very mm -hmm. it was really a good lesson to me in film acting which is different from what i've been learning in you know university theater and i learned a lot from those guys and i really looked up to them and we had some we had some great times creatively it was really intense that thing and then at the rap party george showed us maybe you know eight ten minutes of cut footage and we were blown away it was so oh. good we all thought we were making a really good movie I think we all just were worried that no one would notice. Sure. It was so low budget. We figured it would just get lost in the shuffle. But we thought we were doing something really, really good. Good, good. And, and the next film I want to ask you about was actually the first film I remember seeing you in, which was Starman with Jeff Bridges and uh, Karen Allen. The film was nominated for a number of different awards. Um, and, and it was one of those movies that seemed to find its way on, you know, HBO like every single day. So I think I probably saw the movie, you know, 50 times in my life. <laughs> All right. That was, that was great. I mean, I got the call from uh, those guys. I hadn't met John Carpenter before, but he is another really good, solid guy and a really good director. Um, and he was known for those horror movies and things. Right. Rightfully so. But he, you know, he can direct anything in you know, much wider abilities than just horror films and stuff, which Starman was really a little bit of a different thing for him. And uh, I was just grateful to be invited and 
And that was a fun shoot. Yeah. We traveled all over the country. We had a pretty big budget. So we had plenty of time. We didn't have that kind of pressure. And uh, Karen and, and Jeff, I knew Jeff Bridges already from before. And we had a blast. It was a real fun show. And another really good script. I remember reading the script of that and thought, you can shoot this word for word. I mean, this is, I don't know how many drafts they did of Starman before the movie was made, but that script was polished. It was really good. Wow. Wow. And then the next one I wanted to talk about was The Untouchables, which of course is another classic. And you were part of an amazing cast, not to mention the majority of the film was shot in my hometown of Chicago, which, which uh, always helps for me. Um, tell, tell me about being part of such an amazing film. That was a great experience too. And another terrific director. I've worked with some, you know, amazing directors and that was Brian De Palma. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and shooting most of it in Chicago. And then we did this whole bridge sequence where we intercept a shipment of booze coming down from Canada. We shot that in Montana. And that was that was great as well. Another really good script. David Mamet was the original writer. And um, I had a great time with that, the costumes and all mm -hmm. that stuff. You know, Armani designed the clothes. And uh, I've still got the um, my overcoat from that film. Really? It's beautiful. Oh, yeah. It's <laughs> and it was good. And Kevin and you no, know, no, Kevin Costner hadn't really done much. Nobody really knew much about him. Andy Garcia, nobody knew much about him. Nobody really mm -hmm. heard him. Sean Connery, obviously, is Sean sure. Connery. And uh, but we all got to be, you know, good friends on that. And it was it was an intense experience, but it was a great shoot. Yeah. Now in the late 1980s and then early 1990s, you started expanding your role into writing and producing and directing, but you never actually stopped acting. You've talked about these great directors. Did, did that have anything to do with you wanting to expand your role or was there a reason you wanted to get, do more than just acting? Well, it, it, there, there was, but, it, you know, again, as I was saying, having come, you know, been in university at uh, theater departments, uh, I actually began concentrating on directing when I was in college, mm. but I thought, you know, my dream job would be di directing theater. Right. And that's kind of where I thought I would head, or maybe, as I say, into academic theater and teach at a university level and teach directing and direct plays. So I was always interested in directing, and I did direct plays in college, and I directed um, a couple of plays at a, a small theaters in L.A., when I was in my early 20s. So directing was something I'd always had in mind, but I wasn't sure that I could, that I understood fully the film side of it. I understood directing theater, but you know what you also need to know about film and cameras and all of that, uh, I really learned from paying attention to George, for instance. Mm -hmm. And then I did um, Never Cry Wolf, film that carol ballard directed and i learned an enormous amount from him i spent a year and a half two almost three years on never cry wolf a year and a half of acting and then a year and a half of helping to write voiceover and working with carol and post hmm. so i would sit at the avid no, we didn't have an avid in those days. I guess it was a flatbed. It was a <laughs> steam back or something. And Carol would recut the scenes. We'd talk about them. I remember all the scenes that we shot. And now I was finally in the cutting. And I spent a year just being a sponge, learning about how, because you don't know how to shoot a movie unless you know how to edit one. That, to me, I, I know people try to direct films, but I'm thinking, how do you do that? If you don't, How do you know what to shoot if you don't know how it's going to cut? So I got a film school lesson added to what I already knew from my father and my childhood with him as a director of animation. And then I learned a lot about film from Carol Ballard. And then working on Starman, for instance, and picking the brain of John Carpenter and De Palma and all those guys and started, I directed a couple of little shorts, directed a couple of little commercials and just sort of gradually got into it. Wow. Now, fast forward a few years, and you're introduced to the story of Winter the Dolphin. Do you yeah. remember the first conversation you had about getting involved with Dolphin Tale? I, I do. I got a call from my agent, David Saunders at APA, 
And he said, there's this open assignment. They're looking for a writer director. They've, it's this project at Alcon about a dolphin. Now I had done Air Bud a few years before. Yep. So it had gotten to where anybody with an animal movie, I, you know, I would hear about all the animal-based product projects. <laughs> and I think that's also partly be because of Never Cry Wolf, because I'd been part of that movie, uh, which I'm very proud of. And I learned a lot. And that was very animal and nature oriented. So I got that reputation and I got I heard from my agent and he said they they got a script, but they don't like it. They want to totally rewrite it. And they're looking for uh, somebody who can do a rewrite and direct it. And he sent me the, the script and I read it and I, I could see exactly where it needed to go and why it was falling short. And then I had, he set up a phone conversation with uh, Steve Wagner, who was the, uh, it's one of the producers of the movie, and he was the head creative executive at Alcon, the production mm -hmm. company. And Steve and I talked on the phone. I was up in Vancouver at the time. We had a phone meeting, and we ended up just laughing and telling stories, and we just hit it off over the phone right away. And uh, I said, well, look, I think the problem that you've got here is that the script did not concentrate on the relationship between the boy and Winter. And I said, I think in any movie like this, it's a boy and his dog. In this case, a boy and his dolphin. Yeah. And the basis of that relationship was the script that they had went off into all kinds of other tangents. It had a lot of stuff about the military in it. It had a lot of, uh, it just, uh, and they were going to shelve it. They weren't going to make the movie. They were going to give it, give up on it. I was like their last chance. I was the, <laughs> I was the Hail Mary pass to try to figure out how to make a movie out of this. So I came down and I met uh, Andrew and Broderick, the two executives at Alcon, and we had a long talk. And I said, here's what I think it's got to be. It's got to be the boy and the dolphin. And you got to really make that bond, really create that bond and, and um, build the story from there. And I said, and the beauty is you've got the dolphin and you've got Winter and she's so personable. So they, um, they brought me on. They hired me to do it. I immediately flew down to Clearwater and met Winter, swam with her, and spent about three days just watching the trainers, how they work, watching the facility, learning all about it, learning the animal, and um, then started into right. And uh -huh. I, I did, I don't know, I probably spent about six months completely rewriting the script. And now we've had David Yates and Austin Highsmith Garces on the podcast, so we've talked to them about this. Was there a point in production where you got a sense that Dolphin Tale would have the impact that it did? Was there anything different about the film or was it a surprise to you when it, it touched so many people? I don't know. I guess it was a little bit of a surprise, but I can't say that I was surprised. I was proud of the script that I had done. I thought it, I thought it worked well. I, I put a lot of elements in there of that I thought were entertaining, you know, Rufus the Pelican is uh, one of my better creations, I suppose. <laughs> and, uh, uh, good drama in it. We got a good cast. I was amazed when we got Morgan Freeman. Yeah. And as the shoot went along, we were getting the footage and we were getting good scenes. And, uh, you know, I'd already directed a number of movies by that point. So, mm -hmm. um, and you get a sense for each one. Each one that I have done, I'm proud of in different ways. And I thought this one was coming together pretty well. So I wasn't, I wasn't totally surprised. I also knew that Warner Brothers was going to back it really well, and they did. You know, they gave it a really nice release, and uh, we had all the support that you need from the studio to get your film noticed. And uh, lo and behold, we went up to number one in the box office. I was yeah pleased. Now, you said Warner Brothers was going to back it. Uh, why? Why do you think they specifically saw that this is more, worth really putting energy and effort into? They, they, looked at the, they looked at the movie, you know, or, or pretty much. I don't know if they saw the director's cut before the final cut, but they're pretty much the same. And they looked at the movie and just thought, yeah, this is a really good movie. People are going to like this. You know, it's something a little bit different that hasn't been seen. Uh, I think I was able to give Winter a great sense of personality because mm -hmm. she had a great personality. And I think I was able to capture that on screen. 
I was very proud of the two kids that I found to play the leads. Um, little Cozy Zulsdorf had never been in anything. Yeah. I think one commercial for bottled water or something was all ever done. But I could tell, and it's funny too, because I was, as I was saying, you know, I had always thought I was going to go into theater. Cozy had done theater. She'd done small plays and stuff around Orange County. And I realized that I had to talk to her like a theater actor. She didn't understand film at all, huh. really, film acting. So huh. I would tell her, I would actually say, you know, stage left, stage right. I would, I would use theater terminology to talk to her and to get her, to get her through it, to make her comfortable. Whereas um, uh, Nathan was uh, an experienced film actor, but I was, uh, I think I was able to recognize that these kids were really that talented and would be that good on screen. And it all, it all came together. And I, I had a good crew and, you know, we had the support of the, the support of the aquarium, certainly. Yeah. David, you know, very supportive and everybody there. We had some amazing times. And I was also able to see the impact that uh, winter had on people, you know, on the, people that would come to see her and, you know, children with disabilities and so on. It was very moving. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's funny that you talked about some of those earlier films on how important the story was. And now here it was, you created this story that people were seeing on TV and, and the, the story resonated. I mean, that had to be a, a great sense of accomplishment. It was, it was great. I figured, okay, well, I have learned something over the years. I've learned a couple of things again, you know, stealing from the best from <laughs> Carol Ballard and George Lucas and John yep. Carl. You know, it's like, okay, I've learned some, I've learned some stuff. And I, I learned a lot in my university, actually. I had good theater teachers. And then I studied privately as an actor and director with, um, with Nina Fosh, who was one of the really good teachers in Los Angeles. And I learned a lot of just basics about story structure and writing. You know, there's a great craft to it. Mm -hmm. Hopefully I, you know, I didn't screw it up too badly, so. <laughs> well, and as the story goes, during the rap party for Dolphin Tail at the Clearwater Marine Aquarium, uh, they get a call about another dolphin that needs help. And, and this dolphin would end up being Hope and would be the focal point of Dolphin Tail 2. Tell us about the process of getting from that night of the rep party to the first day of production on Dolphin Tail 2, because of course, nobody saw a sequel coming. Yeah, I know, that's really true. It was so crazy. Uh, it was just one of those karma kind of things. Right next to the aquarium is the uh, big is a big restaurant, lovely restaurant, mm -hmm. and that's where we had the rap party. So it's literally, I don't know, 50 yard walk along the side of the lagoon to the aquarium. So we had the wrap party and I, strangely enough, was very tired after <laughs> directing the movie. And I went to the wrap party and I, you know, did my thing and thanked everybody and shook hands and, you know, had a few pictures taken and I left. Huh. I, 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 I probably made it to about 10 o'clock and I was just exhausted. So I went, I went home, went back to the hotel. Um, and then I got a call from our line producer, Bob Engelman, the next day saying, it's too bad you left because this amazing thing happened <laughs> around midnight. In comes another stranded, you know, baby dolphin, just like it happened with winter. This thing that came in and they talked about how dramatic it was. And of course, almost all of the aquarium staff, the trainers and the people that worked there, they were all at the rap party mm -hmm. and they were all dressed in their best clothes and they all and so they came over to try to help with this thing except they were in their party outfits right. you know and the, the, the women were in high heels and uh, cocktail dresses uh and in comes hope a story that i've become very very acquainted with since then um they literally the, the rescuers uh brought her in they literally hand carried her up into the thing, which is a scene that I recreated for mm -hmm. the sequel. So anyway, that had all happened and it was it was a big deal. And then after Dolphin Tale was so successful and, and they were starting to, the studio was starting to kick around the idea of doing a sequel. One of the things that I said was, well, 
I think part of the allure of Dolphin Tale was that it was a true story. Mm -hmm. This really did happen to Winter. And, you know, Kevin Carroll and the hangar guys really did make her a prosthetic. And even though there were no kids involved in the real story of Winter, I tried to stick to that. So I said, the only, I can't see making a sequel unless it's a true story. The only other true story we got is the rescue of Hope that night mm -hmm. at the party. So uh, I worked with Steve Wegner at Alcon, and we cooked up a story to that would involve hope and that would recreate that rescue. The only thing is I had to come up with a another reason for there to be a party at the thing. I couldn't have it be a rap party. Sure. <laughs> I had to think of a different reason for the characters to be at a party. But I literally recreated it, and I brought back... Um, Dr. Julie Goldstein and Steve McCulloch, who had rescued Hope, they came in, played themselves. They recreated the rescue of it, except that I had Harry Connick carry the dolphin uh -huh. instead of Steve McCulloch because, you know, he's our star. Right. But we based it on that. And then we just thought, well, okay, and the further adventures of Rufus the Pelican, what could we do and how could we make this work? And Steve and I sketched out a story that uh, is based on on that. And so I said, well, on the basis of that, if I can, if I can write a script that keeps the, the, the true life elements, then, then I'm happy to do it. And that script actually turned out pretty well, I think. Yeah, yeah. And you were able to get the band back together for Dolphin Tale 2. I mean, selfishly, I was thrilled that there was a Dolphin Tale 2 because it meant that the company I was working for at the time in Orlando got to do more ADR for the, the second film like we did for the first. But what was it like to do it all over again with almost the exact same cast. It was really wonderful. I can't tell you how wonderful it was. It was so, first of all, when I found out through the studio that Morgan had said yes, and that Ashley Judd had said yes, and you know everybody wanted to come back, that was very gratifying. Yeah. Then to get a, a, most of the crew back, and all the same, and then, you know, the involvement of the, of the aquarium and the support from the Florida film community it was just really lovely. And mm -hmm. just, uh, it was, and to see the two kids again, to see them growing up, and I'd had to write them now as older kids. Right. So I had to write older characters. And, and that was, that was so much fun. It was, it really was a very happy kind of reunion. And we had a, we had a really good shoot. A, a tribute to you as the director, I would think everybody did want to come back and, and be part of your team. I guess so. I mean, that's flattering, and uh, but I, I hope so. Mm -hmm. I hope so. We had, a, we had a terrific time. And I had fun writing that script, probably more fun than any other, because if you think of it, normally when you're writing a film script or a play or anything, you're writing characters and then you when it comes together, then you have to cast them. Mm -hmm. In a sequel like this, you already know who's going to play those parts. Yeah. You're right for actors that you already know. And that's a very different thing for a writer. So when I was writing scenes for Morgan Freeman, I, I had Morgan's voice in my head. Sure. And it was such a joy to just sit down and think, okay, I got Morgan Freeman and Nathan Gamble in this scene uh, talking about a busted watch and a life lesson and I could just write it because I knew both actors. I knew exactly what they could do. I knew how they would sound, you know, it was all, I had it in my head. That's something that screenwriters don't always get. Yeah. And that's put you on the spot. Did you enjoy filming in Clearwater? Yeah, it was great. It was great. I mean, it was like being on holiday. We would stay right there on, on the beach and you could walk to the aquarium from there, mm -hmm. and it's you know, it's a beautiful resort and there are beautiful hotels, and the the aquarium was you know, it was just such a nice place to be. It was it was so much fun. It was great to be able to shoot in all of these sort of really beautiful locations around there, and go to the beach, and go down to, you know, go to the parks and everything. Uh, it was working in such a pretty area is uh, you know that's a dream. Yeah, yeah. And now, of course, since all of that, we lost Winter unexpectedly, and her legacy will live on in Florida forever when you look at what she's done for our industry, for the Clearwater Marine Aquarium, all of Clearwater. But you had a different perspective, though. Talk about what you think Winter's legacy is. 
Well, I think maybe all of those things. And I'm I'm very proud of the fact that, you know, I was able to make those movies and to bring her to the attention of, of everyone, because I think Dolphin Tail would never have been made. Uh, and, and so to have been the guy that came in and and made the film, you know, completely rewrote it and directed it and everything is very, and then to see the impact that Winter has had, it is very gratifying. It's, it's, you feel like a sense of accomplishment. You don't feel that in films often enough. Sometimes movies, you feel like they're kind of just disposable commodities. People go to the theater and they, they laugh and they have a good time. They have some popcorn. And by the next day, they've forgotten mm -hmm. what, the, what the movie was about. Well, that's our culture now, I think, in America a lot. But not the story of winter. That stays with people. And I hear this all the time. They're touched by it, even if they've never went there to see winter. And then, of course, all the people that did, that made the pilgrimage to Clearwater, to actually see her and to see how moved and touched they were. That's... You know, the, the fact that I was the the gateway to all of that is kind of humbling and, and flattering. And it's wonderful. Yeah. Really, yeah. Yeah. Well, Charles, I, I mean, I think talking about winter is is a great way to kind of wrap up the podcast and, and talking about the legacy of her. Uh, it was truly an honor to have you on. I, I really appreciate you making time for us. And uh, I appreciate you being on the Film Floor podcast. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm always happy to talk about that and talk about Winter. And, you know, I had a good relationship with Winter. I think she knew I was the director, by the way. <laughs> when I, she would always look and see what it was that, was, that I wanted. You know, she, she paid attention to me, and I think she was paying attention. I think she knew what was going on. She was a remarkable animal, and, and to have that story shared with the world is really gratifying to me. And, and we're glad you you helped share that story. Oh, thank you. And, you know, I'm so grateful to Florida and the whole film community there for the backing and the support because it couldn't have been done without all that. I appreciate that as well. Thank you very much for your time today, Charles. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Film Florida podcast. For more information about Film Florida, go to filmflorida.org or visit our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. If you're not already a member of Film Florida, please consider joining at filmflorida.org. If you like what you hear on the podcast, please consider going to our website and donating $20.23 for our 2023 fundraising campaign. Check out the Film Florida merchandise at filmflorida.creator-spring.com. And please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast.